y a todas y sean bienvenidos a esta presentación que espero que, que sea de su agrado y para su enriquecimiento en todos aquellos foros en los que trabajan ustedes. Quiero agradecer especialmente a la OCDE y al profesor Andrés Sleiger y a Marta Encinas por todo el trabajo realizado intensamente para dar a luz este informe docentes en Iberoamérica a partir del análisis de PISA y TALIS, que nos parece que es un trabajo, ahora comentaré brevemente, muy importante para todos los que trabajamos en la región iberoamericana en educación. También quiero agradecer al, al equipo de la Fundación SM que ha contribuido a la edición, traducción y coordinación de, de este trabajo, especialmente a Eva, que está por ahí al fondo, eh, por el esfuerzo grande que se ha hecho en, en poco tiempo. Agradecer a Casa de América por la acogida y por la gran disponibilidad para este acto y también esta mañana con los medios. Quiero saludar a, a Mariano Jabonero, secretario general electo de la OEI, eh, y quiero expresar nuestra gratitud porque llevamos años trabajando con, con la OEI y bueno, creo que vamos a seguir trabajando más porque coincidimos en visiones y en misiones sobre la educación en Iberoamérica y en este sentido creo que vamos a poder compartir un futuro de, de colaboración. ¿no? También agradezco la presencia de ustedes, algunos representan a instituciones que han sido invitadas o, o que han podido venir esta tarde. Quiero agradecer también la presencia de la Fundación Santillana eh, por estar aquí hoy y acompañarnos también. Creo que todas las fundaciones que trabajamos por la educación debemos eh, complementarnos. ¿no? Creo que la competencia queda para otros ámbitos. Aquí debemos complementarnos y ojalá que cuanto más sumemos pues podamos hacer más por, por el cambio de la educación. Bien, para, para la Fundación SM, este estudio que hoy presentamos, más que una oportunidad, es un compromiso, un compromiso para contribuir a la mejora progresiva de la educación en la región iberoamericana. Vemos un gran acierto y nos felicitamos por el trabajo realizado por el equipo de la OCDE, el haber combinado información y datos de distintos informes relacionados con PISA y TALIS y, y haber pasado de los datos a la generación de un conocimiento a través del análisis exhaustivo de todos esos datos para poder sacar conclusiones que nos sirvan a todos de cara al futuro y a los cambios que la educación en Iberoamérica pueda acarrear, ¿no? Creemos que trabajar sobre la situación de los maestros y los profesores y profesoras y en Iberoamérica y poder comparar estos datos con los de otros países que también forman parte del informe PISA y TALIS es enriquecedor, no tanto porque genere un ranking de prioridad de países, sino porque creo que el mundo necesita que nos miremos unos a otros y que lejos de ponernos unos delante de otros o encima de otros, podamos aprender más unos de otros. Y en este caso creo que este informe aporta luces para poder encontrar aprendizajes, buenas prácticas, casos de éxito en otros lugares, en otros países, que con las debidas adaptaciones puedan, puedan utilizarse. Consideramos que más que una competición, el informe PISA aporta una mirada de progreso para que cada colectivo medido sea un país, sea una comunidad autónoma, en el caso español, una ciudad o incluso una escuela, pueda ser medida con el informe de PISA, lo importante es que pueda ponerse en contexto con otros colectivos educativos de similares características. Y en ese contexto que pueda plantearse medidas para cambiar y mejorar el aprendizaje de los centros escolares que forman ese colectivo. Pero aún se podría dar más, y pensamos que se puede dar más, si las políticas públicas impulsadas por las administraciones o por los gobiernos nacionales inciden en aquellas claves, en aquellos factores que se detectan como más importantes y que hoy el profesor Schleicher nos expondrá, factores más importantes a la hora de obtener mejores rendimientos de los estudiantes. Estamos convencidos, junto con la OCDE, que... Actuando sobre las políticas relacionadas con profesores y maestros, 
también podrían mejorar las posibilidades de nuestros estudiantes. Es indudable que los profesores y maestros son una palanca clave de transformación de la educación. Sin ellos, ninguna mejora será posible y duradera. Es imposible cambiar la educación sin el cambio en los profesores y los maestros. Impulsando políticas que incluyan los puntos de vista de los y las profesoras, las mejoras en educación serán posibles y posiblemente también sostenibles. Las evaluaciones, los diagnósticos, en nuestra opinión, son necesarios para mejorar y deben estar siempre orientados al desarrollo profesional del docente y a su mejora continua. Por esto entendemos que la capacitación de estos profesionales de la educación debe durar a lo largo de toda la vida y el informe que hoy tenemos delante nos habla de ello. Todos reconocemos que el aprendizaje en los niños y niñas mejora cuando los maestros y las maestras viven su vocación docente con intensidad y con honestidad, porque todos sabemos que nadie aprende de un profesor o de un maestro con el que no sintoniza. Todos recordamos a ese profesor que nos hizo clic, que nos hizo conectar con algo, con alguna capacidad, con alguna competencia, con algún elemento de nuestra personalidad que nos hizo desarrollar un aprendizaje más que otros. ¿no? Me atrevo a afirmar que la educación es el arte de crear vínculos saludables entre educador y educando para generar interacciones que llevan al aprendizaje significativo. Por eso, acompañar a un docente también debe formar parte de su proceso de formación, de su proceso de formación continua a lo largo de toda la vida. Es decir, el acompañante, que sería un educador, también debe ser acompañado. Esa es nuestra visión. Desde nuestra experiencia de Fundación SM en Iberoamérica podemos afirmar que se detectan algunos brotes de esperanza al ver iniciativas de formación del profesorado que ponen en valor nuevas miradas a la educación. Estamos construyendo, con ayuda de muchos aliados como la OEI, como la OCDE y otros más, espacios y plataformas de aprendizaje para educadores en las que puedan participar miles de ellos. Para eso las tecnologías nos deben ayudar siempre que se apliquen y se implanten de modo inteligente y eficaz. Esperamos que junto con los responsables políticos podamos contribuir a una mejora lenta pero segura de la educación en la región para construir un futuro posible con una ciudadanía global, justa, equitativa, solidaria y en paz. Esa es nuestra motivación principal y por ello nos esforzamos cada día. Muchas gracias. Bien, buenas, gracias. buenas tardes a, a todos. En primer lugar, quería agradecer a la, a la Fundación SM, a nuestro anfitrión en Casa de América, a su directora, Sergio Miralles, por haber contado conmigo en este, en este acto, y, y a la OCDE, Andreas, a Marta, Encinas, amiga Marta, por también eh, contar con esta participación. Por mi parte, cuando todavía soy solamente secretario general electo. En este momento en la sala hay dos personajes que tenemos que ver con la OI. Hay un secretario general y un secretario general electo. Estamos ahí dos, dos momentos históricos distintos que tienen que ver con, con una organización ya muy acreditada que cumple 70 años el año que viene. Es la, más, la decana del espacio iberoamericano. En mi condición de secretario general electo, insisto en la, en la formalidad, quería únicamente, por una parte, agradecer a estas entidades que cuenten con nuestra presencia aquí, eh, dar señal de que nuestra presencia tiene que ver con un compromiso muy iberoamericano y de, muy colaboración, de una colaboración muy estrecha con diferentes entidades. Eh, a, a los sitios se va siempre en compañía, no se va solo, es algo que creo, creo que es importante, y más cuando se está hablando de educación en una región como es Iberoamérica, que en este momento hay una agenda, eh, una agenda distinta y una agenda, digamos, con una apuesta de futuro mucho más, más firme y más clara a la que era hace unos años solamente.
Es una región en la que la educación ha cambiado y ha cambiado para bien. ¿Eh? Algunos que llevamos mucho tiempo trabajando en ella somos conscientes de este avance, que ha sido significativo y que es notable. Ha cambiado para bien por diferentes motivos. El primer lugar es la demanda ciudadana. Los hombres y mujeres de la región han demandado más y mejor educación y eso de que nadie se quede atrás en el educativo, porque la educación lo que aporta son más y mejores oportunidades en la vida de las personas. Eso es un discurso típico de Andreas y que creo que corramos todos los que estamos en esta sala. Pero además una educación que ahora mismo con, en el escenario de las... Agenda 2030 eh, tiene que cumplir con requisitos no tanto cuantitativos como ha sido hasta la fecha, que ha sido cobertura, acceso y cobertura, que todos los niños y las niñas accedan a las escuelas y vayan a las escuelas y tengan maestros y maestras que les, les enseñen y que trabajen con ellos y les acompañen en las escuelas, sino otros objetivos que tienen que ver mucho más con otros elementos de calidad. Como, como es calidad, como es equidad, eh, como es inclusión educativa. Ahí tenemos el objetivo número cuatro de los ODS, famoso, en el cual prescribe claramente cuál es la línea de trabajo a seguir. Esa es la línea de trabajo que vamos a seguir en la OI, que yo quiero seguir en la OI, quiero trabajar y la que compartí con los ministros y ministras de Educación que me eligieron eh, de forma generosa el día 26 de abril pasado en la Ciudad de México y que quiero hacer, digamos, poner en valor en una región en la cual también tenemos que poner en valor todo aquello que se ha construido en estos años. Creo que, y aquí hay muchos que hemos sido partícipes de ellos, se han avanzado, se han, puesto, se han conseguido eh, proyectos interesantes, avances significativos y que nuestra región tiene que eh, reconocer, identificar y, y valorar esas buenas prácticas y compartirlas dentro de la región y fuera de la región. Creo que es un tema muy importante tener en cuenta. Eh, decía en la cita previa que si es una región que decía Andreas que Iberoamérica es una región con un gran potencial de desarrollo y es cierto, es cierto. Y es cierto y que eso no se ha plasmado hasta la fecha por varios motivos que creo que son absolutamente conocidos, identificados por todos. Eh, el primer lugar es una región, es la más rica del mundo. Y eso lo sabemos todos. Es la región más rica del mundo, sin embargo, que coincide con que es la región con mayor nivel de inequidad, diferencias entre ricos y pobres. Eso genera efectos de distorsión, efectos que son negativos. Efectos negativos que tienen que ver con su desarrollo económico, desarrollo en un sistema global, desarrollo social y humano. Entonces, yo creo que ese es un factor a tener en cuenta y que la apuesta por el conocimiento es la apuesta de futuro y la apuesta de, eh, por la región. Estamos en, en la sala Simón Bolívar de Casa de América, y Simón Bolívar, en el discurso famoso suyo de Angostura, hizo un diagnóstico que prevalece en el tiempo todavía, y es que las grandes necesidades de Iberoamérica eran moral y luces, es decir, conocimiento y ética. Creo que son dos ejes de trabajo fundamentales, fundamentales para ese futuro. Construcción de ciudadanía iberoamericana, constituido de cohesión, de pertenencia y de identidad, y de preservar valores de democracia, de paz, de libertad, de tolerancia y, por otra parte, conocimiento. Y conocimiento en aquello que tenemos todos y compartimos, que son competencias para el siglo XXI. Unas competencias para unos jóvenes y unos niños y niñas que van a encontrarse un futuro muy distinto al actual, muy diferente en cuanto al desempeño de puestos de empleo, en cuanto a, 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 a su hacer frente a su realidad y a los cambios que se le van a vecinar. Creo que son esos dos focos, esos dos focos siguen teniendo una vigencia histórica importante, moral y luces, ética y conocimiento, y desde la OI creo que nuestro empeño va a ser notable en ese camino. Y ese camino en el cual podremos construir y apoyar políticas públicas en educación a partir solamente a partir de la evidencia que aporta la información que OCDE, UNESCO, tipo de relaciones, proporcionan. No podemos seguir construyendo políticas públicas a base de ocurrencias, a base de alternativas coyunturales. La información que nos facilitan con este tipo de informes es la más valiosa, la más valiosa para poder hacer frente y construir políticas públicas con garantías de éxito. Ese es el camino que queremos seguir y el camino en el cual ojalá cuente con su apoyo y colaboración en estos próximos años. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes a todos. And I sincerely apologize that I present our work in English, but I think they have translation for you here. First of all, I want to thank our wonderful hosts in Casa America. Those of you who have been here before 
would be not surprised that this is always our first place of choice when we present our work from the OECD. It's such a wonderful environment. I want to thank um, our colleagues from um, uh, Fundación SNM who have actually supported the development of this report. And I want to thank also the OEIE who has been actually supporting and following our work since many, many years. I can't thank you yet until the 1st of July, but I will do afterwards. Um, this report that we are launching today is very, very special to us. And it is special not only because it talks about teachers, which is always the most precious asset of any education system. It is special because it's the first time that we have been able to integrate the data that we collect about the learning of students and the outcomes with the data of what teachers do. You might think that's a very obvious thing to do. You know, we know something about students, we know something about teachers, let's put those things together. But it's not so simple methodologically, and it's not so simple for teachers to accept that idea. Many teachers are quite nervous when we link their work to the results of students. So we've worked really, really hard to do this in a way that is acceptable and meaningful to teachers. So that's what I'm going to show you today in this uh, new report. First of all, why do we look at the variation across countries? Because we know there are huge differences in the quality of education systems. You can see that on the vertical axis. The higher countries are up, the better their learning outcomes, the lower they are, the more they struggle to equip students with good knowledge and skills. But there's also the horizontal dimension, the dimension of equity. The further countries are towards the right, the more successful they are in giving students from all social backgrounds a similar education. <coughs> the more they are to the left, the larger the gap between the children from more privileged and poorer backgrounds. There is a lot of variability across countries on quality and equity. And we want to understand what drives those differences and to what extent do teacher policies actually are at the heart of those differences. So that's what we are looking at. And we know, you know, as much as we would like, money is only a part of the answer. You can see among countries that spend very little on education, in fact, that includes many countries in the Ibero-American region, in South America particularly, investment in education is still limited. And in those countries, you can argue that spending more money will get you better results. No? But soon you get beyond the point at which money alone will not help you. No? For most countries in the OECD, the relationship between how much we invest and what we achieve is quite tenuous. We need to think harder about how do we utilize our resources, and that includes teachers. No? So this is the motivation. And we have asked ourselves three questions. You know, first of all, how do those countries that are doing best identify and recruit and select their teachers, how they develop them, how they promote them, and how do they ensure that every student benefits from excellent teaching? How does the distribution of teachers across schools affect equity? Which countries are most successful to attract the most talented teachers in the most challenging classrooms? And do they get the best school leaders for the most difficult schools? And we have asked ourselves to what extent schools in disadvantage can provide excellent results with the right approaches to teaching and learning. So let me start with the first question. Is there something special about education systems that are really successful? You know, we looked at the countries that do really well on the PISA test. Obviously, we start with this. But we also looked at countries that improved a lot since 2006, maybe from a lower level of performance. But we wanted to see, is there something they have done specially? And again, once you take into account the social background of schools, what is most predictive for their success? No? Of course, when I look at the surface, when I compare the results of schools, I find a lot of difference. No? But much of that has to do with the environment in which schools operate. No? If you work in a rich neighborhood, of course, you, know, you can easier produce better results than you work in a poor neighborhood. But the magic of PISA is that you can take that into account. 
And you can ask yourself the question, how would schools perform if they had the same students? We can actually look into those questions in detail. The first thing I wanted to sh show you is that something that most people associate with success. You know, If I want to be successful, I need to have the freedom as a school to hire my own teachers. Well, and some schools have this. Some high-performing education systems basically gives their schools a lot of discretion to choose their teachers. You know, you can look at Macau, Estonia, New Zealand, Norway, England, Slovenia, and so on. And a whole range of countries where schools can choose the teachers they want to work with. But there are also other high-performing countries like Japan and Korea. They are very successful where that's actually not the case. Schools do not choose their own teachers. So you can say, well, some countries do that, but it's not everywhere. So this is not one of the magic tools of high-performing education systems. Here's a more interesting picture. On the horizontal axis, I show you the share of schools where principals have a very active role in teacher professional development. It's not just sending teachers to some university, but doing something yourself at the school, building a professional community of learners, building an environment where teachers grow in their careers, where teachers are supported with courses at the school. And you can see that is actually related to the quality of learning outcomes. And actually, if you look at the highest performing education systems, I've put them in the red box. In most of them, there's a strong emphasis in schools on supporting the advancement of teachers. So we have found one common characteristics of high-performing education systems, but there are more. We also found that most high-performing education systems educate their teachers not just in universities, but they give them a lot of clinical experience. Teachers actually, from the first day of teacher training, spend their time not just on academic learning, but at learning in the schools, in the workplace where they're going to end up later on. A kind of you know, work-based learning experience for teachers, very common in high-performing education systems. We also, and I already mentioned this, we see that there are very specially tailored opportunities for teachers to develop in the schools. And there are mechanisms of teacher appraisal that are linked to professional improvement. No? It's not so much you know, about evaluating teachers for purpose of accountability. You also see that in some countries. But what unites high-performing education system is a culture of appraisal, no? where teachers every day see the results of their work. And those results are given back to them to help them teach better, to help the students learn better, and to help the schools to become more effective. So appraisal and improvement. Those are clear elements that we see across the highest performing education systems. Here's something that you might find surprising. On the horizontal axis, I show you the difference in mathematics performance between students who want to become teachers. No? We ask students at age 15, what do you want to do in your life? And you know, one of the answers you could give is, I want to become a teacher. No? And on the horizontal axis, you see the difference in mathematics performance between students who want to become teachers as opposed to students who want to become other professionals. And you can see there are some countries in the green area. That's basically countries where high-performing students actually are more likely to become teachers than other professionals. At least that's what they say when they are 15 years old. But in the red area, you have students where who do well, who are not so likely to want to become a teacher. Overall, you can see that that's unfortunately the reality. But when you look at the highest performing education systems, you can really see that teaching is an attractive career choice for many of the highest performing education systems. Think about this for a moment. At age 15, there must be something in the education system that has conveyed to those young people the teaching is something important. The teaching is to be valued. What that is, is beyond the data, but it seems that you know, we can create a culture in high-performing education systems that makes teaching you know, attractive to young people as a career choice. Now, 
there are things that basically um, <clears throat> are not related to improved outcomes. For example, we looked at you know, countries that have made classes larger, that includes Spain, you see them in the red area, versus countries that have made classes smaller between 2006 and 2015, you see them in the green area, and you can see that's one of the most popular things for countries that have done in the last decade. No? If you make the classes in schools smaller, you get very popular. You know, teachers will like you, parents will like you, and for politicians it's easy to do. And you can see that's what a lot of countries have done. But actually, decreases in class sizes have not been related to improvements in learning outcomes. No? And in fact, it's a very expensive thing to do. No? You know, as a, in a country, you have to always make difficult choices. If you have one extra euro to spend, you can make it the classes smaller. But then, you know, you can't also pay your teachers better. And you can also invest more in the professional development of teachers. And you can also invest in more student learning time. So it's a difficult choice, but one that we have not found to be related to improvements in learning outcomes. No. So in a nutshell, we see that there is a positive relationship between student learning outcomes and the experience of teachers, no. experienced Teachers for education systems to retain teachers in the profession have more experience. That seems to be positively the outcomes. Uh, where there is a lot of instability in the teaching force, that's something that tends to be more negatively related to student learning outcomes. It's not surprising, perhaps. We've also looked at behavior and classroom climate. And also here we find that teacher experience is something that is positively related. Also, the share of teachers who are fully certified, something that seems to be positively related to um, behavior, and support. The extent to which teachers feel supported by their principals seems to be correlated with student behavior and classroom climate. No? We don't know much about the cause or nature of that relationship. That's a different question. But we see that those things somehow seem to be related. Let's go to the question of equity. To what extent are we successful to attract the most talented teachers to the most challenging classrooms? First of all, I want to show you a chart that I find really important. And I've chosen a country that is not represented here, the United States. And I show you the learning outcomes by decile of social background. Now, the red dot is the learning outcomes of schools from the 10% most disadvantaged families. The green dot are the learning outcomes from the 10% of the most privileged families. And you can see, you know, in the United States, the family where you come from has a huge impact for your success in school. And you may say, well, that's not so surprising. That's what you expect, you know. Children from privileged families, they find many open doors in life, many different ways to success, so you expect them to do better in school. Some people say, well, there's nothing you can do about it. No. Poverty is destiny. But look at this. If you are a student from exactly the same family background as the red dot in the United States, and you are a student in Singapore with that condition, you perform as well as the average student in the United States. And if you are among the 10% most disadvantaged students in the province of Shanghai in China, you do as well as the students from the 10% most privileged families in the United States. And this show, shows us that poverty is not destiny, that there's something we can do about it. And of course, we ask ourselves, to what extent has that to do with how we attract talented teachers into difficult classrooms? That's the chart that motivated us to do this. And if you think this is about you know, China and the United States, it's actually not. You can do that for all countries. You know, I can start with the Dominican Republic, you know, ordering students by the desk of social background. I can do that for virtually every other country. And I can show you that actually the country where you go to school has a much greater impact on your success in school than the family background from which you come. You know? Again, you know, you look at the 10% most disadvantaged students in Vietnam or Estonia, you know, they come from poor backgrounds, but they still do well in school. 
very, very important. We can do something about the relationship between social background and learning outcomes. So, what is this to do with teaching? We ask ourselves those questions. To what extent has our schools from disadvantaged backgrounds able to attract you know, very experienced, highly qualified teachers? To what extent you know, are disadvantaged or disparities in teachers being reflected in disparities in student learning outcomes? We wanted to find out, and we actually found out that some, some very interesting. Look at this chart carefully. What you see here is basically four quarters of schools. The bottom quarter means the most disadvantaged schools. The top quarter means the most privileged schools measured by the social background of their students. No? And what you see here is the class size. And perhaps surprisingly, you see that actually the most disadvantaged schools have the smallest class size on average across countries. The privileged schools have the largest class size. By the way, this is not quite true for Spain. Actually, Spain is penalizing students from disadvantage by giving them particularly large class size. But that is an exception for Spain. In most countries, the general tendency is this. So in a way, you can say, oh, well, we are very equitable. We actually give students from disadvantage better conditions by giving them more teachers looks really very equitable. But you know, look at the next chart. When we actually ask school principals about you know, lack of qualified teaching resources, the complaints among disadvantaged schools were much greater than among privileged schools. So yes, we put more teachers into disadvantaged schools, but when it comes to the really talented teachers, they still often end up in the easy-to-teach schools. So we're doing well in quantity when it comes to equity, but we're not doing well on equity. And you can also see when it comes to teacher qualifications. Now, this is the share of teachers without a kind of specialized degree in science. Why did I look at science? Because we tested science in the PISA assessment. And you can see again, you know, there is a much greater shortage of qualified teachers for the disadvantaged than for the privileged students. So, you know, if I just count people, you know, it looks we've done an ama amazing job in education. We have assured, you know, better conditions for disadvantaged schools. But the moment we look at quality, it looks the other way around. There's still a long way we have to do, go to actually make education more equitable. And you know, you can see with experience, the picture is not so clear, but also there, the teachers in the lowest, least advantaged schools tend to stay less. You know, they are less experienced in their work. So again, those are dimensions that we have to really work on. If you just look at the kind of balance of this, now in quantity terms, things look very good. You know, only a very few countries where sort of numbers work against disadvantage. You have basically 38 countries where you can say, well, actually we're putting more resources into disadvantaged schools, only three where our sort of spending is regressive. But you know, when you look at the kind of quality dimensions, the odds are hugely stacked against disadvantage. That is the challenge for education. Now, 23 against three. Very few countries have been reasonably successful to make a deliberate effort to align quality with needs. Now, of course, the question is, what makes more of a difference, quantity or quality and equity? No? The first thing that we looked at is at quantity. And in green, I show you those countries where classes are smaller in the kind of less privileged areas, and in red, the countries where uh, we give class, larger classes to disadvantaged students. And you can see actually, and then on the vertical axis, see the social disparities and learning outcomes, and you can actually see there is not much to see. No. Quantity and resources and equity and outcomes don't relate really well. But when you look actually to some, and basically here is just a picture, if you look at the class sizes in absolute terms, you can see in Brazil, 
Chile and Mexico and the Iber Ibero-American countries' classes are very large, but you look at Portugal, Spain, they're pretty close to the OECD average on this. No? So that's the quantity picture. But when you look at the quality of, uh, uh, of teachers, no? basically measured by having a specialized qualification or having more experience, you can really see how disparities in that are clearly linked to equity in outcomes, right? social disparities in learning outcomes. Now, again, we don't know what the cause or nature of that relationship, but it's important to keep in mind where we are better in attracting the more talented teachers, the more better qualified teachers, the more experienced teachers in the more disadvantaged schools, that's where we're also likely to see less disparities in learning outcomes. And, you know, something that we also measured in the report is teacher professionalism, and you can see how widely this varies. No? Well, when teacher, people talk about teacher professionalism, they talk about many things, but the way we measure this at the OECD is three things. The knowledge that teachers have. No? Do they really know their subject? Do they really know their students? Do they know how their students learn? Pedagogy, content, and student knowledge. So it's very important. But that's only one dimension of teacher professionalism. The other dim dimension is, can I be an innovative designer of a new learning environment, a professional autonomy? And it's not about, you know, I do what I like. It's about I do what I know is right in the name of my profession. I have an ownership of my professional practice, professional autonomy. And even that is not enough. The third element that we found to be very important is a collaborative culture. Do I work together with my colleagues to frame good practice? Do I help myself and my colleagues actually to advance in their careers? And those kinds of collaborative practices are very important. And we can see how this can be different. I contrast here, you know, Spain and Singapore. You can see in Spain, teacher knowledge is so-so, teacher professional autonomy is quite limited, peer networks are not so well developed, teachers are working very much in isolation. If you go to Singapore, the triangle is really, really large in the sense that teachers are very well prepared when they enter the profession. They have a fair amount of discretion in how they work and they work in a collaborative culture. They spend about 100 hours every year to you know, advance their careers, to work in professional learning communities, to observe other teachers' classes. So they're very much engaged, not just in communicating knowledge, but in actually developing professional practice. So those things really, really vary across countries. Now here's one of the most surprising findings. We had one hypothesis when we did this study we said, well, you know, everybody talks about school autonomy these years. No? Very important driver for you know, innovation, flexibility in the system. But isn't there a risk that if schools become more autonomous, that the system becomes more inequitable? You could think that. No? When schools have, you know, for example, greater discretion on hiring their own teachers, then, of course, the better performing schools who know who the best teachers are will have an advantage. Well, actually, the data show us exactly the opposite. When you look at this chart, the schools that are more autonomous, that have greater discretion on choosing their teachers, the countries actually are the countries in which education is more equitable. Again, this doesn't suggest cause and effect. No? You can say, basically, if you make your schools more autonomous, that's probably not going to make your school system more equitable. No. But what it does tell us is that those education systems that have given their schools more ownership, more possibilities, more responsibilities, are typically also education systems that take great care of equity that have a very strong system overall, a system that manages knowledge, that ensures that there's coherence in the system, that ensures teacher mobility, and that ensures that there are resource allocations so that the best teachers end up in the most difficult schools. A really interesting finding how professional autonomy and equity can go together if the policies are right. There is no inherent contradiction between those two 
dimensions, as you know, many suspect, including us at the OECD. So what is behind those kinds of successes, you know, ensuring equity through kind of in an autonomous environment? And actually, we found lots of interesting things. First of all, most education systems that have a lot of local responsibility are very good in managing the school network as a whole. They sometimes you know, link high and low performing schools. They build kind of framework for quality assurance. They build frameworks for teacher mobility. They, they, the more autonomy you have, the stronger the education system in those systems. Some of them use formula-based funding to ensure that resources are matched to needs. Now, they may give money to schools or money to households and they make choices, but the idea is always to ensure that those students who need the best education obtain the resources that they really need. They manage school choice. You know, if you go to countries like you know, in Europe, the Netherlands or Flanders or Hong Kong in Asia, Almost every school is run by some private entity. There's a lot of kind of flexibility in the system, but they're very, very careful in managing the school choice so that actually choice that not, not lead to inequity. They foster collaboration between high and low performing schools. No? In China, if you are a high performing school, they give you more money. But you can't spend that money in your own school. You can spend that money to hire better expertise, but that expertise is used to help a low-performing school advance. No? Brazil is a country in the state of Chiaros, tried similar things, no? using the expertise of strong schools to improve the education system overall. No? Pairing high and low-performing schools. The same stroke for teachers and school principals often. No? And then, of course, you know, parents and stakeholders. No? very, very important resource to mediate the impact of social background. No? So there are lots of things that we can do. The last point I really want to go through is actually who wants to become a teacher? Basically, the question that we ask 15-year-olds on the PISA test, what do you want to do in your life? What kind of job do you want to do? And I admit, you know, one in 10 of the students had no idea that I left that question blank. But most 15-year-olds, they told us something. You know, when I was 15, I probably had no idea what I'm going to do, and I don't know what I actually wrote into this. But, you know, the students, we asked them, and they wrote something. And actually, what they write has some real implications. For example, we ask students to what extent they want to become professionals. And you have about every second 15-year-old who said, I want to become a professional. And that's a pretty good reflection of our current workplaces. And we had about 4% of students who say, I want to become a teacher. And amazingly, that is a pretty good reflection of the share of teachers in the workforce. Now you can, in Spain, it was slightly more, almost 6%. So you can see in Spain, teaching used to be a bit more attractive. You can also see there are differences across the genders. No? There are more girls than boys who say they want to become a teacher. And surprise, surprise, that's reflected in our teaching forces. No? We see that teaching was a less preferred choice among immigrant populations. Again, that's the reality. And we see that there was a slight link to parental level of education, a more educated parents have children who are less like, more likely to actually become, aspire to become a teacher. No? So you actually, what you, the story that 15 year olds tell us is something that is not come from nowhere, but that is a pretty good reflection of what we're actually seeing in our current societies. Now, we also know the test scores of those students. No? And one of the things that we saw perhaps are fortunate that in most countries, actually, students aspiring to become teachers scored a little bit less in mathematics than students aspiring to become other professionals. No? And that's actually true in most countries. No? There's no exception where it actually goes the other round. There, despite all myths, you know, people say, you know, teachers come from the highest share of the graduate distribution. It's not what we see. And actually, in most countries, students who aspire to become teachers are a little bit less proficient in the test. And in Spain, actually, that gap is even larger. 
and in some of the Ibero-American countries, the gap is also fairly substantial. Now, in some sense, that is reflected in the status of the teaching profession. One of the things that we did is we asked teachers to what extent they believe that their kind of profession is valued by society. And what you can see is, you know, in Singapore, in Korea, in Finland, and so on, most teachers you know, tell you my profession is really valued in society. That's really good. If you get to sort of Chile, it's only about, you know, one third. And you can go to Brazil and Portugal and Spain where it's only one in ten teachers who believe that their profession is valued by society now. So that again is something we have to think about. You know, what is it that makes the teaching profession more or less valued in a country? It's not about salaries alone. You know, you don't build a relationship with just pay. You know? It's often not about the financial attractiveness of teaching, but the intellectual attractiveness of teaching. But so this gives you some reflection. The other question you can ask yourself, to what extent is this actually reflected in the skills of teachers? Now, how do we measure the skills of teachers? Well, one of the things that we did at the OECD, we went out in the workforce and tested everybody's skills, including teachers. And uh, on this chart, you see the middle half of the skill distribution, in this case numeracy, among college graduates. So you can see Japanese, Finnish, Flemish, German, Norwegian, Dutch, uh, college graduates have a relatively high skill distribution and then you can see sort of at the lower end United States, Estonia, Poland, Spain where college graduates are a little bit less skilled on average. But where do teachers fit into this picture? No, this is all college graduates. Well the answer is this. And this is quite interesting. No, in most countries, actually, teachers are pretty typical people. No. I'm saying this because we often hear, you know, teachers come from the most able part of the graduate distribution, or teachers come from the least able part of the graduate distribution. That is actually not true. In most countries, teachers are pretty normal people, no. pretty average college graduates. No. But there's some exception, you know. Uh, you can take Japan and Finland, where, you know, College grads are highly skilled, and teachers a little bit more better skilled than the average college graduate. You compare that with Norway, where you can say Norwegian college graduates are as highly skilled as Finnish college graduates, but you know teachers a little bit less skilled in Norway than in Finland. And you can look at the lower end of the skill distribution. So there's some variability. But the good news is while among the 15-year-olds, the skills of those who aspire to become teachers are significantly lower than the skills who aspire to other professions, in the real workforce, that's actually not the case. Most teachers are pretty much as highly skilled as most other professions. So we need to look at other kinds of factors. So let me just wrap this up. First of all, to improve the effectiveness of teaching, efficiency and also equity in schooling. It really matters of who we recruit into teaching, who becomes a teacher, how we make teaching both financially and intellectually attractive. To ensure that the teaching is, is of consistent high priority and this is up to date, that we continue to invest in the education of teachers. And then most importantly, how we match resources with needs, how we link the quality of teachers with the kind of conditions in schools. How do we make this attractive for highly qualified people to take on the toughest pieces of work? You know, in other professions, we are doing better on this. No? If you're a surgeon, you don't want to go every day into hospital and do all the simple standard operations. You want to operate the most, you know, this, this, the patients with the serious sickness and diseases, you want to get into the most difficult pieces of work. In education, we have not yet succeeded to get you know, the most qualified people doing the most difficult work and doing the work that actually makes most of a difference. Now, once again, if you come from a privileged family background, 
you'll find many open doors in life. Even if you don't succeed so well in school, you will somehow find your way in life. No? But if you come from a disadvantaged background, you only have one card to play, and that is a good school education. You miss that boat, and you are not going to get a second chance. You know, People have all this talk about lifelong learning. You know, I, so for many years, I'm hearing this. But all our data shows exactly the opposite. Actually, those people who become lifelong learners are the ones who got a good school education. And those people who did not get a good school education are the people who are least likely to have the motivation and the capacity to continue learning through our lives. So it's really important to get this right. And it's about how we develop teachers and how we make sure that we ensure that every student benefits from excellent teaching. Thank you very much.